Welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome to today's live stream. It's so good to see you all here. Uh, I'm here with uh, the GOAT, Walker Reynolds. Welcome, welcome everyone. What's up, dude? Uh, not much. Going? Not much. Uh, dude, it's, 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 uh, it's good to see you here. It's good to see everyone in the audience. Uh, hey, Carrie. Hey, Mario. Hey, David. Good to see you all. We have a good show for you guys this week. I'm going to touch on <clears throat> three things. Obviously, we're going to talk about Elon Musk buying Twitter. We're just going to touch on that really quick. Um, number two, I'm actually going to tell you a story. We were originally going to shoot a video on it. If you guys have, had watched the uh, the series that we started, which is the most difficult decisions um, I've had to make in my career. If you guys have watched that, I shot the second part two of that today. And there was a story I realized at the end that I didn't tell that sort of in between um, that was earlier in my career. And I'm going to talk about that. Um, and then we're going to do our unified namespace use case today. We'll get a little bit more in detail. This this one, this use case, I think, will uh, is going to apply to a lot more people um, in general. But uh, and then I'm, I'm going to answer. What's, what's, what's the use case? So it's a mobile wastewater company. So it's a, a company that makes uh, water reclaiming and uh, reverse osmosis water uh, treatment facilities that are basically mobile. They're on rigs. Um, and they, they're they used in like after disasters. So like after hurricanes and stuff, like FEMA uses their systems, um, oil and gas drillers, when they're drilling oil wells, they use these water systems really they're, they're in the most remote areas in the world. Um, and uh, when we got involved with this company, they were basically a startup. Um, we got involved really, really early um, in, their, um, in their life cycle. We've been working with them since 2017. I'm going to talk about the UNS, that specific use case. It's different than all of the other use cases. So I think uh, I've mentioned it in a previous video. I think it was... Uh, industry 4.0 versus industry 3.0 use case. It was a video from maybe three years ago or something, but I'm going to get more into detail on their system and how it's evolved in the last three years. So, and then we're going to answer some questions on self-aware SCADA that has carried over. Um, but uh, before we get started, um, what I wanted to do is I want to, let's, let's talk about um, Elon Musk buying Twitter. Uh, within the context of what we do. So there was a, a whole question that everyone, you know, whether it doesn't matter really how you feel about it. I suspect most of our audience thinks it's a good thing that Elon purchased Twitter. But let's let's peel back the onion a little bit and talk about why. Like, you know, why would a guy like <clears throat> Elon Musk spend $44 billion on a company that doesn't make any money? Right. And th this, conver this conversation came up earlier. Like, is it a good thing? Or why would Elon do it? You know, why, why would he buy Twitter? What's the reason? And it's, it's been approved. So if, if anyone hasn't heard it, I think as of like today, it's been approved. Right? Yep. It's happening. Yeah, we're going to have a conversation about this. Yeah, I'm, I only want to talk about this a couple of minutes. And we'll talk about it in, de in depth in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, because right now, if you want to read about it, you can. If you go on Twitter, it's the only thing trending. Um, so let me talk about a couple of things. So I, I personally think uh, that Twitter is the the best social media platform uh, ever created. Uh, for me, it was absolutely my favorite from like 2012 until to the 2020 election. Um, Twitter was my f absolute favorite platform. I was on Twitter and both Facebook during the... Um, that during the election and I was, uh, I was uncomfortable with how Facebook and Twitter, um, censored, um, information. Um, and so I left both platforms. Okay. Um, I left, uh, in I think August of 2020. So I've been off both platforms for about a year and a half. I think I still have like a business Facebook page. Is that right, Zach? Do we still yeah, have yeah. Like a business? You, you don't do parlor anymore. No parlor. No, I, I mean, I, I went on parlor to see what it was like, but <clears throat> it was pretty extreme. It was Club, super extreme stuff. Club, so clubhouse. Uh, no, no clubhouse. Just uh, I, I have Instagram for my family stuff, and that was it. 
Um, in TikTok for your personal stuff. I don't use TikTok. <laughs> Come on, man. I wouldn't put TikTok. Not on even my... not even when you're on the on the uh, the, the toilet, just scrolling YouTube. through TikTok. YouTube shorts or whatever. Yeah. YouTube and Instagram. I'm not a huge social media guy, but let's, let's talk about, let's, let's peel back the onion here, right? What, a, what is Elon Musk's mission in life? To save and create middle class. No, that's, that's yours. Um, yeah. What's his mission? Save humanity from, uh, right. you know, make, he wants to make, make life a multi-planetary species, make, make life, you know, exciting and uh, inspiring for future places to live. He has a two prong approach, right? Here on Earth, he wants to make us more sustainable and he wants to make us interplanetary so that we can be sustainable long term, right? I mean, come on. <laughs> those the, those are science fiction goals that he he makes he makes a reality. No one but, thinks about that, right? That's not an elementary thing for right. survival. We're not Yeah, nobody says, "Hey, I'm I'm the I'm going to single-handedly make us more you know, more sustainable. Elon Musk has done more for human sustainability in the last decade than all other people combined in all of human history. Okay. You could argue that it's been imperfect and it has, right? I mean, it, it electric cars still for the most part get charged by coal and natural gas facilities, but that will transition, right? He, he actively works on better battery technology. He actively works on the the infrastructure acquiring the data for full self driving the whole deal right they're, going, they're getting into mining right um, so right Elon Musk Elon Musk has done more for the the, ar the only arguments I see against Elon Musk is that Elon Musk hasn't has isn't perfect and therefore he you know but he he isn't perfect he hasn't done everything exactly perfectly therefore we can't, we, he, you know, we can't trust him or whatever. Elon Musk wants to change the world. He wants to sustain humanity. What does he say is the biggest, uh, um, the biggest f uh, risk against humankind? What is the biggest fear that we should have as human beings? In the short term, it's, it's like the woke mind virus. It's, it's like the, but what, what is, what is he, what ourselves. is, uh, we are our own biggest risk. What does he consistently say is the biggest risk, the biggest thing we have to worry about? AI, AI. Artificial AI. intelligence, right? That's the thing we need to be most scared of, with correct? Social, social media, which controls right. our perception and could tear us apart. Right. But he talks about the, the, the woke mind virus. And here's the reality. It, you know, and this is a simple truth. You know, I'm 48. I just turned 48 years old. Um, you know, originally studied history and communications, switched to sociology. I've studied the science of how people organize. This is what my expertise is before I became an engineer. We've never been closer to tearing apart Western civilization than we are right now, right? And that has to do with uh, acrimony and divisiveness, right? Elon Musk, I think what he sees from his perspective, whether he's right or wrong, um, is what he sees is, is that the biggest risk to humanity is no longer the immediate risk is that we will tear ourselves apart socially. And he believes that the solution to that obviously is open discourse. I also believe that. I believe that the best ideas need to win. And in order for the best ideas to win, you have to have an open conversation. Okay. Twitter is the de facto town square. He talks about that all the time. What does that mean? It's the place where people go to have conversations. What's an, what's an example of something that a couple months ago you'd be afraid to say on Twitter that sure. now with Elon owning it, you'd be sure. So fair, let's, fair, fair question to ask. Sure. Absolutely. Right. So if you look, without um, trying to get us demonetized. <laughs> yeah. Without trying to get us into trouble, but you know, let's, let's, let's talk about an example of what, has driven Elon Musk to spend $44 billion to acquire Twitter to uh, modify the way Twitter operates so that people can have open conversations about ideas going forward in the digital town square. That's obviously what his goal is. Um, you know, we people talk about facts and they, you know, you, you can have every, you're entitled to your own feelings and opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. Well, what actually are facts? Objective uh, reality. 
Well, yeah, they're objective and uh, and subjective. So here's a really good example. Here here are here are some facts that we should all be able to agree on. Okay? Basic ones. Like what is a woman? What is a man? When does life start? Um, you know, how much election uh, uh, uh how much fraud in an election is significant fraud, right? These are things that we should be able to agree on. But we don't as a society, right? No, no matter where you fall on the on the spectrum, we we everyone agrees that we don't agree as a society on what is a woman or what is a man or when life starts, right? There is disagreement across our Western civilization on those three really basic things, right? So whether you you think one way or another, you what you have to agree is that the only way that we can come to consensus is by having free and open conversations about those questions. The best ideas have to win. We have as a as a society we have to be able to have conversations and come to consensus. You can't do that if once you have power, you take the people who don't think like you and you shut off their voice. I mean imagine Just a, Imagine just if a few they shut us down. Yeah, just a few months ago. Imagine if Rockwell Automation had the power to shut me up. What? Imagine if if uh, Siemens or Emerson or um, you know the uh, you know the big the big huge integrators. Imagine if they had the ability to shut me up. Do you think that they they wouldn't exercise that power once they had it because I'm a pain in their ass? Of course they would. Well. That's what, that's what big tech, that's what digital media, that's what they've been doing, right? People that they disagree, if they disagree with what you believe, they twist that into you are hateful or you are wrong. And therefore, in the good of, of, of all society, we're going to shut you up. That's why he, he bought um, Twitter, right? He believes in free speech and free discourse. Why? Because he wants us to come to consens consensus as a society. And why does he want to do that? Because if he doesn't, we're going to destroy ourselves long before sustainability and interplanetary travel is going to matter. Right. That's the reason he acquired Twitter. And by the way, this is a conversation I don't think anyone's really having. Elon Musk wants to save humanity. He is what I refer to as a principled capitalist. And that's why we're talking about this. He's a principled capitalist. Elon Musk doesn't make money because he wants to be rich. Elon Musk makes money because he knows revolution costs money. He knows that in order to have an impact on the world, you've got to have the capital to have the impact. I say to my people all the time in our organization, and you know, the people who work here can all tell you this, I don't pay attention to the dollars and cents at all. I get at Intellic Integration, I get a, uh, a, a, a report every once a month in a board meeting on our financials. I don't see it during the week. I don't, I don't see, I don't ever talk about the money. I talk about our values, our mission, and our strategy. And then there are people who are tasked with keeping us in business so we can make a difference. Okay? I don't believe CEOs should be focusing on the financials. I don't. Okay? I think that they should solve financial problems when those problems pop up, but they shouldn't be keeping track of the financials on a daily basis. Why? Because if you're in the, per if you're in the business of just making money in this day and age, then you're about 50 years too late. Okay, principled capitalism is the future. Elon Musk is a principled capitalist. We'll have a conversation about this going forward, but I, I didn't even want to talk about it. But team members said, hey, listen, this is the biggest story in the world right now. Elon Musk, we talk about him all the time. You've, you've got to comment on the Twitter thing. So um, what I would say, I want to say something. David, uh, there was a guy who said, uh, um, he said, you know, you, you, you know, you don't want to trust Elon Musk, right? Elon Musk is not. Elon Musk is. Um, here's something I've learned from Elon Musk. <clears throat> we talk about our our core values all the time of transparency, authenticity, expertise, humility, and servant leadership. Why are we a transparent organization? What does that mean? What it means is, is that anyone in our organization, we openly share all information within our business that we are legally allowed to share. So we don't, you know, if there's some law that says we can't share that somebody's got cancer, right. We don't share that information, but yeah. everything else is, um, is open game. That is, you're allowed to talk about how much money you make with your peers. 
Uh, if you want to know how much money we have in the bank account, we'll tell you. Why do we do that? And I want to hear from the audience. Why, why would it be in an organization's best interest to be as transparent as humanly possible? I want to hear the audience, their response. Why is transparency a good thing for an organization? And while we wait for the answer. Say two said, I sometimes describe MQTT to folks as Twitter for machines, LOL. So part of it is employees will trust you. Okay. That's part of it. Builds trust. Here, here's the, no, here's the number one reason. <coughs> there you go. Henry transparency develops ownership to cause. There are some absolute truths. Does anybody disagree with the statement, this statement, that absolute power corrupts absolutely? Transparency keeps leaders honest. If you have the power to own information and you own authority, then wouldn't you just use information to maintain your authority? Transparency keeps leadership honest. Okay. E even good people will abuse power because that is part of the fallen nature of humanity. Okay. Transparency keeps leadership honest. Like Eli, even Elon Musk recognizes this. So for even Elon Musk recognizes that if he, if he uses strategies to give him absolute power, he too will abuse it. Therefore, this is why he he is such a big proponent of um, open source. Is David is Elon perfectly transparent? Definitely not, and I don't think anyone is perfectly transparent. But it's much better to be imperfectly transparent than perfectly autocratic, right? Or or to embrace your power and authority. And I don't think anyone would argue that Elon Musk embraces the power and authority. He is. Come on. He, he's the wealthiest man in the world and he's using his money for good. He's not, he, he, he's trying to save humanity. And if he hasn't convinced us now by at this point, if you are not convinced that Elon Musk wants to save humanity from itself, then I don't know what else he could do to convince you that can right. convince you of that. His, this acquisition of Twitter is, is, is in furtherance of his life's mission which is to save humanity from itself. Sa saving every twi twi saving one Twitter shareholder at a time from their board. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. So we went a, that went a little longer than I had hoped, but um, I wanted to, I wanted to make sure I touched on it and we, we will touch on it in a couple of weeks, but um, real quick, just, you know, obligatory stuff. Thank you to today's um, sponsor, which is the Digital Factory Mastermind Program, uh, the 12-week accelerator program. We are right up to the last uh, last session, which is uh, week 12, which is um, data ops. That's tomorrow, Mastermind Accelerator. Zach will be teaching that class. I think is at 2 o'clock Central, Zach. Is that what time you guys do it? Yep. Okay. Um, that that uh, tomorrow is data ops. Please make sure you take a look at either data ops part one or data ops part two for those of you who are in mastermind before you get into that, that session tomorrow. Um, quick reminder for those of you in the Dallas area, Thursday, May 5th at six o'clock, um, I'm going to be giving about a little over a one hour presentation at the IOT happy hour for the IOT Texas group. <clears throat> That's at the Spring Hill Suites by Marriott in uh, Richardson which is uh, in Northeast Dallas. Um, and I think, Zach, will you include a link to that meetup um, in the description after, after our session today? Will do. Um, real quick, I'm going to touch on this real fast, tell you a story, and then let's get into our use case, our water wastewater use case. And if you guys have any questions, please, uh, please uh, ask in the chat. But um, I, I, Every couple of weeks or so, I'll, I'll get a message um, about the Palantir, the company Palantir, P-A-L-A-N-T-I-R. Um, hey, what do you think about, you know, their new platform foundry? You know, um, here, here's my answer on Palantir, just, just so 
hopefully the people who I, I'm generally getting this a request once a week to comment on Palantir. I don't talk about them. Uh, here's why. Um, the uh, Peter Thiel. Uh, Peter Thiel is not Elon Musk. Peter Thiel is the chairman of Palantir. They were started in 2003, right after 9-11. They worked in conjunction with the CIA to primarily do, to, they did uh, primarily um, they did big data analytics, right? Um, they, uh, they did an immigration thing um, initially. Um, post 9-11, they were basically analyzing big data and and really using big data in, you know, you, one can argue to hurt people. Right. And then, um, and then actually they, I, I can't remember if they acquired another company or what it was, but, uh, during COVID they were doing big data analytics to look at the effectiveness of vaccines and that kind of stuff. Uh, Palantir has a platform called foundry that, that came out a couple of years ago. That's really focused on like industry. Okay. Industry 4.0. Yeah, in industry 4.0 in general, right? Um, they say a lot of good technical stuff. Here's the reason I don't talk about Palantir. It's because I don't trust Palantir. I don't trust Peter Thiel's motives. I don't trust their history, their 17-year history before they went public. I don't trust that they are a vision, uh, vision-driven, mission-based organization. Um, and I don't trust them to not uh, exploit... Um, exploit uh, their customers, um, their uh, principals, and their stakeholders uh, if they have the opportunity to. It's just a, it's a matter of trust. If you look at Palantir's um, marketing over the last three years, if you look at, especially with the lead up to the Foundry release, they changed the way that they communicated um, trying to sell to industrial customers. And that communication was stolen from us and people like us. So they don't use the term unified namespace, but they do do node driven. They, 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 they bounce around the, out, I, the outside of our messaging without attributing it to the, to uh, attributing that messaging to the people who created it. And it is very clear that they didn't come up with it on their own. They hijacked other people's messaging. Okay. So when it comes to Palantir, I am not a fan. Okay, I and it, it's not that I I don't believe that there are technical there are technical merits of what they've developed, but it's a it's a matter of trust. Okay, and which brings me back to principled capitalism. Okay, I just don't trust the company. My opinion may change if I ever one day sit down with Peter Thiel or talk to their chief architect or learn enough about their company. But what I can say is that between two thousand and three and two thousand and twenty two. Uh, with everything that I've learned about Palantir, everything I've an analyzed about the way they operate their business, they are not the type of organization I want to be associated with, which is why I don't respond to the emails that people send to me when they say, hey, can you talk about Palantir? If I, I wouldn't trust, I, I would not trust my data um, to Palantir um, any more than I would trust my data with my worst enemy. All right. Hopefully that answers it. I try not to be uh, from a technological perspective. I think they're doing some pretty cool stuff, but what they do with what they acquire is the thing that I really, I question. Um, all right. Hopefully that wasn't too harsh. Uh, let me go back to, I want to tell a story. If you guys have been uh, any comments on that, Zach, that anything you want to chime in on there? I know. Uh, yeah. I mean, I know uh, they get talked a lot about in Wall Street and stuff and have a right. high valuation, but yeah. Uh, well, they still haven't turned a profit, by the way. I mean, which is another thing you should really be questioning. If you're not turning profit in big data, then how, how are you not turning a profit? Um, let me ask you, let me, you know, how are they not turning profit? Uh, if you guys have watched the series, there's a new series that we started, which is, um, you know, the most difficult decisions I've had to make in my career. And that, 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 those questions are coming from like uh, students, primarily uh, people just out of college or people at a transitional um, are at a, a transitional phase in their career, say they're five or 10 years in and they're trying to make the decision whether or not to jump. So we started this new series a couple of weeks ago, which is, um, you know, the three most difficult decisions um, I've had to make uh, in my career in order to 
get to where I'm at right now. So in the very, we've broken the series down into three steps. So the, the first phase of my career, which was between 10 and 12 years working for the end user, that first video was all about the three most difficult decisions I had to make during that phase. And then the plan had been the second video would be the three most difficult decisions I had to make while I worked for other integrators. And I only, I only worked for two other integrators. Um, but I shot that video this morning and I actually only got through the first integrator. So it's going to end up being a four video series because the next video I'll, I'll shoot will be the three most difficult decisions I had to make working for the second integrator before I went into business for myself. But, uh, there, there's a story I skipped over, um, which should have been in the first video. And the reason why it was just, a, it was a function of time. And, um, and I decided today that I actually think this is a really helpful story for people who are looking for guidance on making career decisions. Okay. So if you watch that first video, you guys will know that, um, I went and I worked for a, um, a printing company. The second job I ever had, uh, in industry was working for a printing company. So I spent five years in, in mining. And then I spent a year just doing temp jobs. I did a data mining job. I did a, uh, I worked for a biosciences firm building a controller for a robot that controlled a mass spectrometer. Uh, and then I, I did a gig working in a skilled nursing unit doing, um, filing in the evening, right? Before I got the offer to go work in the printing company, I got an offer working for a company that makes uh, bottles, shampoo, and conditioner, and toothpaste for like the hotel industry. Okay, so this was a a company that they they had been in business for a very long time. They were based in um, Cortland, New York, so about twenty minutes from where I lived in upstate New York. Um, they didn't have a very good reputation as an employer, but the reason I even considered going to work there was because they had recently, uh, the general manager who had taken over had just come there from a large beer company who I knew a lot about their technical infrastructure and knew that, hey, this, this company that's got <clears throat> all of this old technology and old human resources practices is now been taken over by a company that's really on the bleed or by a leader who's from a company that's on the bleeding edge. And it might be a really unique opportunity um, to help transform this, this employer who employs something like 800 employees or something. So there was a new position that had come up and that, and it was an engineering position. Um, it was an electrical systems engineer, I think is the name of the title. So I, I go and interview and, and, um, I get, I get, you know, we negotiate on the salary and I take the job. And when I start, I start my, um, men, my, um, onboarding the following week. So this is before I go work for the printing company. Uh, there, are, there's me and two other guys who are brand new in these positions. So we meet the general manager who's from this big beer company and he, when, um, when I meet him, he's very, uh, I don't know, slimy, right? He, you know, he comes across as almost like a used car salesman, but super, super smart. Like, obviously he was a brilliant guy, right? So part of that one week onboarding on like day three was we were going to do a full, f uh, plant, um, tour. Now the plant was enormous. So a huge facility because they did, they did shampoo, they did conditioner, they put them in those little plastic packages, either in little plastic bottles or in the, the little pouches, right? So a lot of the control systems were like uh, electric over pneumatic. That was a lot of it. They were using a lot of little suction things to open bags and that kind of thing. And um, so we're doing our tour and, and I start meeting like a lot of like really gifted technical people like in their maintenance department. There's a you know, electricians and mechanics and electromechanical people, right? And one of the questions that we, that I started asking was why, how come you're not in my position? Like, why did you, why did they hire me instead of promoting you? 
right? I didn't ask the question of the guy, but I was asking that question in my head. And me and the other two guys started talking about this. Like, hey, don't you we think it's a little weird that they didn't promote any of the these like really gifted technical people into one of these positions? And uh, we asked, we broached the subject with a couple of them and, and they said, oh, we applied for those positions, but we just didn't get them. Um, and that was a warning flag for me. It was, oh, wow, what's the, you know, the deal here? So uh, we went and talked to that general manager. And in the conversation, the general manager conveyed to us that he didn't have any faith in anyone who currently worked there. And he wanted to create like his own, his own group of people. Um, and uh, I, I left, went home that day. I felt totally uncomfortable about it. I'm like, and I started thinking about what type of leader is that, right? What type of leader isn't first going to try and convert the existing human resource to his way of thinking. And it was the kind of leader I don't want to work for. So I went back the next day and told him I couldn't, I couldn't take the position. That was day four. And I said, I couldn't take the position. And to my surprise, the other two guys that started with me did the exact same thing. All three of us quit on day four, just said, Hey, you know, we're this, this isn't for us. We, I did it for a bunch of reasons. Part of it was philosophical, but the other one where you quit on the spot, I didn't quit on the spot. It was, you know, I was still within the first four days of working there. So it was, I was onboarding. Right. And, um, and what it was, was he, he had really, well, the organization had sort of misrepresented to us. Um, they, they really misrepresented to us the position, why we were there, what the philosophy was, you know, and, and what they had done was they had put us in a, in a position where we were going to be the enemy to these, these, these people who had been working there for 10, 12, 20 years, you know, and certainly a couple of, one of the guys was an electrical engineer and they just didn't promote him into this position, which was really like a mid-level and he more than deserved to be in that position. So yeah, that, that would upset me <clears throat> if I were that person. So I, I didn't tell that story. It was a, it, and it wasn't honestly, that wasn't that difficult of a decision for me. It was, they sort of, they definitely misrepresented what the job was all about and right. you know, when was the job created, et cetera. So, um, you know, I bailed, I, I just said, this isn't for me, you know, and, but to my surprise, the other two guys did the exact same thing. Um, and so the, the lesson there, at least if, if a young person is telling me it goes back to values again, you know, we live in a day and age where work is not just a place you go eight hours a day. Okay. That's not the future of work, the future of, or the present, you know, the future of work is, is now you're always at work. You're always at home. You're not going to invite people into your home who don't value the same things that you value who don't have a common mutual respect for you. And you shouldn't do the same. You shouldn't make the same mistake at work either. Um, anyway, hopefully that was helpful because that's not something I'm ever going to shoot a video on or shoot a, uh, a big video on. All right, ja Zach, any, any comments in there? Do you want to go over the, the clarify thing? Yeah, we should clarify that. <laughs> You want to do that? Yeah. You want to Rick, clarify that? Rick Schoonover said, great material. This is my first time listening live. Uh, welcome, Rick. My colleague, hey. yeah. Dave Hellier, sent me the link. Thanks, Dave, for shoot, shoot, sharing uh, the stream. How do I get yeah. future links? Join IIoT University. Like, If you join the Discord, you'll get added to our email list. We send out a weekly email with like the weekly topic of whatever the, and you know, subscribe and ring the bell, all that kind of good stuff too. But Chuck, Chuck Riggle, transparency leads to greater accountability. 100% man. Hello, Joshua, Daniel. All right, let's do uh clarify.io. You, you want to go over that Zach? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually like, I'm, I'm working on setting it up right now here in the background, but um, yeah. So we mentioned it last week. We're partnered with clarify. They're one of our sponsors ongoing. Now we do have a link that will be in the description to sign up for clarify for one of their free accounts you get like some additional so normally like they have a free account but when you sign up using our link you get four free users and 40 free signals which is like pretty valuable i mean there if you if you had to pick like your top kpis you up to 40 of them and you could do that completely for free have it hosted in the cloud and it's a time series database where you can 
you know, have up to four users for free and kind of like contextualize and, and comment and have like social uh, an engagement around your time series data is like, yeah. So what the reason that I agreed to partner with clarify, it, bo it really boils down to two things. All right. So they, their message is time series intelligence for industrial teams. That's a really nice marketing term. What's the real value of clarify. Okay. Clarify is really good at aggregating many different time series data together and normalizing that data for data scientists. That's really the big thing. Like there's a lot of like yeah. basic time series stuff where you, you can use the social media component to share the analytics from time series data across teams, right? That that's the cool part but, or that's the part I think it's going to be used the most, but the biggest value comes from under the hood, the way that they aggregate time series data from many different, um, originating nodes is by the by a function of aggregating that data together normalizes that data so this is that let's go back to the most common example if a data scientist wants to um write a linear regression that is for every this every value x i want to predict the likely outcome y um, in order for me to find the relationship between X and Y, the pattern in X that's going to indicate what the likely output Y would be, I need to have like a failure trigger. And that failure trigger might be, how do I know that I'm out of control? It might be my quality number is low, right? Well, if I believe that there is a, if, if, if I calculate quality every 60 seconds, or I calculate it every five minutes, okay? And I believe that there's a relationship between a sensor that is a sensor that change where the value changes, you know, at 60 Hertz, 60 times per second. If I'm a data scientist and I want to write a model that's going to compare the two, A, when I see this trigger, that means that I've got a problem. Go look for the pattern, right? If I'm, that's when I'm training my model. The first thing I have to do is normalize the value that changes once every five minutes with a value that changes 60 times per second. This is what data scientists spend the vast majority of their time doing. They call this scrubbing data, aggregating data, cleaning data, modeling data, however they want to describe it. But when we talk about it as normalization, this is a basic fundamental issue in data scientist, science and why it is that so many companies have such a huge challenge in unlocking the potential in predictive analytics. And it's because the data isn't in the format the data scientist needs in order for them to easily and seamlessly look for patterns in that data. Normalization is one of the very first steps. Clarify.io, the way that they built the platform, just by virtue of connecting all those things together, they do the normalization for you. So by default, when I'm analyzing the data, I'm analyzing fully normalized data across many time series sources. So... We do the same thing in the unified namespace. It's one of the advantages of the UNS is that by default, you have structure, you have values, and you have normalized data. And that means that we can seamlessly take the step to you know, doing predictive analytics, whether that's linear regression, whatever. Yeah, speaking of the water use case, I think Clarify would be a great uh, you know, use case for like a water, wastewater type of application where you know, your tank levels, your flow rates, you know, your main KPIs it's it makes sense to unlock that time series data and then like to your point you know uns you, once you set up your unified namespace clarify plugs straight into the unified namespace once you get your data into clarify you can open it up right inside of a jupyter notebook start using python to analyze your data it's like a you know machine you know a, a data scientist dream system to be able to work with that information all within you know the clarify platform or the Jup you know, any Python library, the Jupyter notebook unlocks that full. You're not having to you're not limited to its capabilities. It's got that full open ecosystem. And that's why we love it, you know. Clark, uh Clark Sarge, uh first timer here. I work with Jeff Rankin and welcome, Clark. Let me say something real quick. In the video I shot this morning, I actually gave Jeff Rankin in a shout out um <laughs> or unprompted, right? And and I, I want to take this opportunity to do it again and sort of repeat what I, I did in the video this morning that I shot. But um, I get a lot of questions from students. Like I just did an interview. Um, there was like a grad student who interviewed me like on a podcast for his thesis. Right. Um, 
And then I did a, another interview with this company called MITR, which is Manufacturing Intelligence Technology Recruiting. It's a new startup that recruits like uh, techno- technology professionals for Industry 4.0. And uh, one of the questions that he had, they, they both asked me the same question, and it was, you know, what's the difference in the education between a person in Industry 3.0 professional and Industry 4.0 professional? And, and what is the future of education? And I, and I said, well, you know, the future is actually now, like there's this guy, Jeff Rankin in at Penn college, who's a professor of robotics and automation at Penn college in Pennsylvania, who has been for the last year and a half, really trying to drive the, the traditional university education you get in automation. Um, he's trying to, he's taking the hybrid approach to education, which is you're getting all the you're getting the theoretical knowledge and the hands-on knowledge in the lab through your normal coursework. But at the same time, you're getting the on-the-job training through a hybrid educational model. The way Jeff Rankinen does it is through IIoT.university. So he's a member of our mastermind program. He has his students sit through and, and listen to our podcast each week and watch our, our other content. I think they've all done the, the free IoT mini course. Jeff Rankinen is a real leader in 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 education for industry 4.0 but from a very formal perspective right he is a professor at penn college and we work with the dean of the school that he's in charge of so you know i have no commercial relationship with jeff or anything i you know jeff and i have had personal conversations it's all been through this professional he's reached out and said man we love what you're doing and we really want to use what you teach for our students you know jeff is an example of what more more um he's an example of what more educators should be doing in universities right right now you can't go get an industry 4.0 education at a university that is if if you just go to university you can't even if you go to purdue you're going to come out and be you know a manufacturing or mechanical engineer who's best suited to, to work for an oem but you're certainly not going to be doing digital transformation right out of the box. Jeff's entire goal is to create an education where you can help with digital transformation from day one. Right. And so Clark, welcome to the, to the podcast, man, and give Jeff a high five for me. If he's not, not they watching do also, today. Jeff also is engaging <clears throat> with the end user and sort of engaging the college. So they sort of have like a vocational program where like the local manufacturers not only are they like gearing up these students to get jobs and placements there, but like be able to, they want to be able to like, you know, Jeff's goal is to be able to do a DTMA with an end user and have the students participate in that learning as a learning experience, you know? Hey, the, d- say too, that's a really good question. Um, so he just asked uh, Henry, who is from clarify.io. Henry is the CTO, right? Is it, yeah, uh, no, he's the chief uh, commercial officer. Yeah, okay, he is, Henry's a CMO. But uh, say to ask the question, Henry, uh, thoughts on data clean rooms from the Clarify point of view? That question alone um, is a is reason enough to bring Clarify Henry on. and yeah, Clarify on and, and interview them on the podcast because that's actually a a really really good question. I I don't want to get into clean room data clean rooms right now because I want to do the use case, but. Um, that's a great question, say too. By the way, I will right, we'll make a note of that. All right, let's do our UNS use case. So this is the fourth use case. Okay, um, this is a uh, water wastewater, mobile water wastewater um, organization. So let me kind of before we got involved, um, when we first met this company, uh, they're based here in Texas. They were a startup. I think they'd only been around for a couple of years. Um, they had. Basically, what they build is they build um, two types of rigs. So when I say rig, think uh, you know recreational vehicle almost. It looks like it's a it's a it's a uh, box trailer that in on one trailer has a water reclaimer where it reclaims wastewater from mobile locations, and the other rig, its sister rig, is the um, is the water rig which does the um, the uh, wastewater treatment so that it creates potable water that you can use for showers, drinking, all that kind of stuff. Okay. So what they did was they built mobile water wastewater facilities and they do it by building two separate rigs. Okay. The controls package. So they do reverse osmosis. All right. So all of your normal 
uh, water wastewater um, uh, processes. Okay. Um, for those of you that don't, um, for those of you that don't know, there is a there's a process in water wastewater, which is really about optimizing. Um, they basically do a back flush to uh, clear out the. It's not a filter, but we'll call it a filter for the non-water wastewater people. Um, they do a back flush, and that back flush is a function of differential pressure. As they as the quote unquote filter gets more and more plugged, they do a back flush. Uh, take the debris to waste and then it, it increases the life of the um the filter quote unquote it's not actually a filter but um it's a it's a barrier that goes in the middle um there is some very valuable intellectual property that they have in terms of how it is they determine when to do the back flush and the wastewater treatment so what they do is they build these rigs standalone. Think of it as a, yeah, I don't know how long they are, maybe 60 feet long, and they get pulled by tractor trailers into, lo into position. They get plugged, hooked up to power. They, um, they uh, get connected to the internet through uh, 3G hotspots. Um, and then, you know, people who are working on drill rigging or drill sites, um, People who don't have any water or sewer because a hurricane came through and wiped out infrastructure, they basically go up to these rigs. The rigs are connected to showers. They take showers. They drink the water, that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, the control systems are all Siemens. Okay. So uh, S7 1200s, they have PLCs on each of these rigs. Um, and then they use WinCC for the HMIs. And it's all state-of-the-art controls but they have a 3G infrastructure um, because in most cases, there's no LTE in the locations where these rigs exist. Um, and, and they don't have any hardware internet either. They're literally, in many cases, they're out in the middle of the desert. Um, when we first got involved, what they, they had a, a, a business analyst, a business intelligence specialist who was tasked with doing their ArcGIS development. So that is plotting these rigs wherever they are in the world on a live map so that the operations group would know where these rigs are actually located in the world. And if there was a problem, how to get to them. Okay. Uh, their, the, their solution for building a control room and being able to monitor these rigs remotely was to install Ewan cozies on each of these rigs with, at the tune of, you know, eight, 800 to a thousand dollars each. They used eCatcher. They paid for an eCatcher um, subscription, and they would set up manual alarms in uh, each of the e ones to monitor very specific discrete values or analog values. And there's a limited number of alarms you can configure in an e one if you've never worked with one. An e one is is the old version of the industrial VPN, um, and they talk Modbus and that kind of stuff. So they uh, they would get an email from a rig saying that there's a problem. And then what they would do is the, if from the control room, they would get on eCatcher, connect to the eCatcher service. Then they would remote into that rig. Then they'd, then they do VNC to the WinCC HMI. And then they would click through all the screens to try and find the problem and fix it. Obviously, there's a whole host of issues with that type of approach for remote monitoring. Okay. Um, not the least of which is when the internet goes down, they won't know that they're not talking to the rig because they're not getting um, uh, emails from a, they're not getting emails from a, a rig that's not connected to the internet. Uh, Peter Shine, what is the new version on industrial VPN? Um, that's definitely going to be TossyBox, like the TossyBox style infrastructure, which is what we use, T-O-S-I-B-O-X. Um, all right, so couple of things because this company was a startup they only had about 30 rigs when they first started so that is 60 60 of the box trailers so 60 assets but they're generally used in in pairs uh, a reclaimer and a water rig okay so they only had about 30 of those but they were they were growing super super fast and they knew that they were going to build about another hundred very quickly and what they wanted us to do was they wanted us to use our strategies to basically make it so that whenever a rig, a new rig came online, when they drove it out of the factory, when they made it, 
They could literally hook it up to a tractor trailer. All they wanted to do was give that rig an ID, a digital ID, take it out to the location where it was going to go. And the moment it was hooked up to power, it connected into the infrastructure and in the control room, the operators were going to be able to control it remotely. Okay. At the same time, the business intelligence um, manager, um, she's really a combination of a data scientist and a and, uh, data analyst. She was the one who built all the uh, ArcGIS maps and did all the Esri development. She wanted to be able to uh, analyze data by asset type. So the challenge that we had, and this is the big challenge, and this is where we get into how we actually implemented it, was they really couldn't afford to spend thousands of dollars on each rig bringing it online. Okay, So we couldn't put in more robust internet. You know, we had to deal with 3G, which is basically 275K a second, okay, in terms of transmission rates at best, okay? Um, each of these rigs had like a thousand tags. So I had a thousand data points that we needed to monitor. And I think something like 900 all, to, all told, uh, each of the rig pairs. Um, and they were over crappy internet connection. But they also, we determined they could only afford to spend about $800 per pair to integrate. So think about that. They, we could only increase the cost of manufacturing this, um, manufacturing this industry 4.0 infrastructure by 800 bucks a rig. So here's what we decided to do. That means that we couldn't, we couldn't put ignition on each uh, rig because the ignition license alone costs more than $800. We couldn't afford to put a Kepware Siemens driver because the Siemens driver is like 500 bucks. We, we, we were really, really hamstrung in terms of what we could design. So long story short, we, we tested many. We knew we were going to put an industrial PC. So we knew we were going to put an industrial PC on the rig. Uh, we knew that we were going to develop an MQTT transmitter and transmit all the data over MQTT to a common cloud-based server that their control room would access, okay? Uh, we also knew that we were going to connect the unified namespace in the cloud uh, to ArcGIS and the Esri server as, as along with their fleet management software so that we could unify fleet management, dispatch, and um, rig location with all the process data and alarms. And then the last thing, we wanted to be able to do ad hoc grouping of these rigs. So they had basically three types of assets. They had a uh, water reclaimer, that is the, the wastewater. They had water processing, which was the water rig that made the potable water. And then they had what was known as a standalone rig. That is, they had just standalone water where maybe they consumed water from a garden hose and processed it to make it potable. Okay. But they wanted to be able to, sometimes you would take a rig and you, you would take a water rig the, and you would break it off from its pair, its reclaiming rig, to use it as a standalone. So there needed to be flexibility in the process. Also, a rig got, might get moved without operations knowing that the rig got moved. It might get moved by the customer. And so the rig had to be able to report back to the control room that it had been moved, where its new location was, et cetera, et cetera. When, we were all, when it was all said and done, this is what we did. We, we originally tested a Raspberry Pi, but it didn't have enough horsepower for us to use as the industrial PC. Uh, we moved up to a commercial grade industrial PC that was like $180, but it uh, just didn't, uh, couldn't handle the temperature. So we eventually settled on the Advantech Uno um, using a Linux operating system. Uh, we wrote a startup script that would image each Advantech Uno. You guys can look at um, the Advantech Uno's uh, on their website, it's you know quad core processor, blah blah blah. I think they all come shipped with Windows, but we installed Linux. Um, we were they cost us about three hundred and fifty bucks, give or take, um, maybe four hundred dollars each. We wrote a custom transmitter. Okay, so we wrote a custom MQTT transmitter in Python. Um, we use an open source Siemens driver to talk to the S seven twelve hundreds. Um, and then basically what we do is we have two attributes that we have to define when we, um, 
when we bring an industrial PC online. It gets installed inside the control cabinet. It gets plugged into the switch. It gets imaged. And then we define two things. Number one, what is the name of the asset? So it could be something like, you know, whatever, rig, whatever, quadruple 418. And, uh, and then we put in the IP address of the MQTT broker in the cloud. Once the power comes on, it streams all the data up into the unified namespace. So I did have tell it which asset type it is. Uh, the prefix is the asset type. So if I give it an asset, if I give it an asset of WR018, then it knows the asset type is water rig. If I give it an asset type of SAWR, then that's standalone W water rig, whatever number. So the asset type is in is semantically highlighted in the uh, um, in the definition of the asset. And I did have a chance to before we we came on here. I I showed Zach had never seen right. the system before, so I had a chance to take him through and show him dashboarding, ArcGIS integration, uh, um, supervisor control and data acquisition integration, all the analytics. And what's most, I think the thing that stands out to most people when we review this system for them is you have, uh, today you, there are more than 300 assets. So that is more than 300 rigs total. I think it's like 360. Uh, each asset has six topical namespaces inside of it. So six groupings, you know, you may have process variables as a namespace. And then inside of that is 500 tags, right? 500 topics. So each, each of the assets has six namespaces with a total of 100 or about 1,000 topics. All of those values update once a second over a 3G connection from hundreds of assets into a common infrastructure. So each rig has got its own 3G connection, and yet they have absolute, all of the data is aggregated in the cloud, and they have 100% visibility. If a rig gets get, gets disconnected, so that is the internet goes down, the power goes out, whatever it is, they are notified that that asset is offline now, automatically from the infrastructure, the, because you have a stateful MQTT connection that drives it. Now, whenever they build a new rig, part of the building that new rig is the Avantec Uno is in the bill of materials. Uh, they define the asset ID. They provision that that Advantec Una themselves. They install it in the control in in the control panel. They put in the IP address of the broker. They put in not just the IP address, but also the login credentials, the certificate, and then they they give it an asset name. And the moment the power turns on, that rig is online and fully integrated. Not just integrated to control to remote control that is uh, in the control room, but it's also integrated into. ArcGIS and Esri, and it's also integrated into their fleet management software. So total spend, we, we started engaging with them in f the fall of 2017. We work with them today in two, in two, in, uh, uh, you know, we're currently working with them by adding new features as they request them. They have spent less than $250,000 total, $250,000 total on all, all, all 300 assets combined. And when we were doing the actual number, it worked out to just over $780 per asset. Uh, let me answer um, Annabelle Velarde's. Is it a bare bones MQTT implementation? No spark plug B. No, it is spark plug B, Annabelle. Um, all of the data that comes from each of the individual rigs is, is over spark plug B. Each, each node in the namespace is a spark plug B node from each rig, individual rig. So say I've got a pair, which is a water, I've got a reclaimer rig, which has got all the wastewater, and then I've got a water rig and they're used as a pair in tandem. Each of those are a node. It's not, it's not uh, one node or uh, the, the pair are a node. They're actually each their own individual nodes, but there's only one industrial PC for both rigs. So you're, you're sharing the industrial PC across the two rigs, but there is actually two transmitters set up, one for the reclaimer, one for the water. I have a question. Go ahead, Zach. <clears throat> so I know it was a long time ago, so maybe it was like before this was like mainstream, but like imagine <clears throat> when, you know, we had a 
all the, like when we're working on that large enterprise integration where a lot of the data was like and it's oil and gas industry so a lot of the data was coming over remote radio networks where there was like you know it would take 15 minutes to an hour to pull you know to do a pull response type of architecture with kept kept where and right that's kind of what there was like, existing and yeah like why, like, didn't we, why didn't we just go to the edge and be like hey look we're going to do an edge installation uh and we're going to convert it to this you know report by exception architecture at the edge so you can get data within a few seconds versus pulling and having to wait so this, this is a really good question so i mean hindsight's 2020 20, but the reason we didn't do it we proposed it the reason we didn't do it was time so one of the things that really set this implementation, this, this water wastewater implementation apart was the leadership of the organization. When I originally met with them in 2017, I told them that we need to take about six months to get the architecture right. Like we need to, we need to go optimal. You only have 30 assets. What's the total number of assets you're going to build in the next six months? Let's spend the next, next six months and let's get this exactly right, exactly the architecture we want. Like, are we going to send one payload? Are we going to use spark plug B? Are we not? Are we going to use an industrial PC? Are we going to install another PLC? Are we going to rewrite the code you have in your S7 1200s? Let's get it exactly right. They could afford, you know, we, we, five years later, we still, you know, we still work, we're, we're still actively engaged with this client. We still build features for them. We still extend their solution. We actually host the infrastructure for these guys. Also, they don't, they, we, we host the server. They want us to maintain everything. So, but five years later, we still work with them. I feel like it would be a really good use case for clarify. Yeah. in the project that we did by, and they also use Canary labs historian, which you guys, so we have ignition in the cloud as the platform on the edge. Everything is just running in raw, raw clinics linux with python and this open source siemens driver and then everything's converted there um and then uh um in the cloud they've got esri um you know ArcGIS by esri they've got uh canary labs historian uh they have an ignition platform and then they have their fleet management software but um oh, shoot, we're we, yeah we're a couple minutes over but um the point is the reason we didn't do that in that project that you and i worked on was we had it we had to be done with phase one, which was the first three states. We had it only an eighteen month window. And it, and and we had to do we had to do fourteen thousand sites and forty thousand devices. So we had to do that was a requirement. We just had to yeah. do, you know, so we had a short window. All right. It was um, kind of like doing the industry three integration first before we moved to four But let me let me say this. This is the most important part here. You know, they have spent Less than 250,000 um, devices total, or $250,000 total in five years. Okay. And as they develop, as they build new rigs, all they do is, is put a, an industrial PC on, image it, configure two parameters, and, and they're fully integrated, totally self aware. That is, as soon as the rig is on, it, it shows up in the navigation. Uh, Narav Patel, did you evaluate edge gateways like Winetech CMTS series? The answer is yes, we did. We eval we part of our plan was to use the CMTS VR. That's what we tested was CMTS VR, not from yeah, Winetech, yeah. but from Maple Systems. Same concept, um, and uh, it we couldn't get under our eight hundred our eight hundred dollar total threshold doing it that way. Um, so anyway, um. This was we we got this to under I think just over seven hundred bucks per per rig, so. <coughs> All right, Thanks there are no other on. questions, Zach. All right, man, appreciate you. We'll see you guys next.